I thank God for a mighty man of God who is largely responsible for evangelism. He's here this morning to bring the word. None other than Pastor Keith Jackson. Let us welcome Pastor Keith Jackson. Amen. Thank you, Sister Carol. Thank you. Philadelphia family. The church of brotherly love and sisterly affection. It's in the Bible. The, na the name Philadelphia means brotherly love. And we have to exemplify that. As I said last time I was here, in the spirit of this church. And Sister Carol hit on a very important aspect of the Philadelphian church which is its evangelistic thrust. The Philadelphia church was the church, as she said, where God said, I set an open door before you. So friends, we can go anywhere in Trinidad. Amen. An open door has been set before Amen. the Philadelphia church, the church of brotherly love Amen. and sisterly affection. Amen. The door is before us. It's up to us to become energetic and to probe every community we can Trinidad and Tobago. Knowing that God has set before us an open door and nobody can shut it. God bless you all. Philadelphia family, you may have your seats. The last time I was with you, this morning we heard so much about the goodness of God and the testimonies that we listened to. But God is not only very, very good, He is also a God of amazing love. And we saw that when I spoke with you last time I was here, April the 21st, which is a month ago, we spoke about God's amazing love for us. And we spoke specifically about the atonement and the atoning death of Jesus Christ when we spoke of his amazing love. And we looked at four aspects of the atonement. We explained that the word atonement means to make amends for, to pay for. Our salvation was paid for when Christ went to the cross. He bore the full penalty for our sins. The full penalty. And we looked at the atonement in terms of making amends. And we started by looking at the gulf between, if you recall, holy, a holy God and sinful man. And we said that that gulf between a holy God and a sinful man could not be bridged because God had a righteous anger against sin, sinful man. And so, if you recall, I told you that when a family suffers the loss of someone tragically, especially through murder. And they go before the courts and the courts condemn the accused to death. The family comes out saying, we got justice. Remember I shared that with you? We got justice. And the family's anger and wrath is appeased. It's pacified because the courts gave them justice. And we said that was a picture of how God had required justice and that his justice had to be satisfied. Just as the justice of those family members feel justified when the judge says you are condemned to die. They come out saying we got justice. 
And God had to get justice for the sins of mankind. God had to get justice. And so we looked at the whole issue of propitiation. Remember that big word we use? Yes. It's in the Bible. It's in John 4 and 10. Could you put up the scripture for this to me? John 4, 10. And propitiation means the taking away of God's wrath, his anger against sin. Propitiation. I'm just recapping quickly. I told you that in the Old Testament days, God's anger against sin was taken away by sin offerings of lambs and bulls and goats and so on. But it wasn't perfect. It had to wait until the coming of the perfect sacrifice in his son at Calvary, which happened in the New Testament. But God required justice. God required justice, First John, not John 4. First John. Just like man requires justice when wrong has been done, and a murderer stands accused. And the demand for justice is appeased, pacified. When they get a guilty verdict, so it is with God. So there's propitiation. And he said, herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is what was required. God's justice had to be satisfied. But to satisfy it, you have to find a substitute, somebody to die for those sins, somebody to pay the penalty for those sins. You have to find a substitute. And 1 Peter 2 and 24 tells us that that substitute was in his son. That substitute was in his son. First Peter 2 and 24. The prophet Isaiah, remember, he said, told us that he was wounded for our transgressions. Not for anything he did. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. He became another was our substitute. He stood in our place. And Peter says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He bore our sins. That was the substitute. He didn't go to the cross for himself because he did no wrong. So God had to find a substitute that would pacify, appease his anger against sin. And we said that there was nobody righteous enough on the earth because a guilty sinner cannot die for a guilty sinner. And we said that the only righteous person, sinless person, who could die to propitiate the sins of man was his son. That's why he sent his son, his sinless son, to become the propitiation, the substitute. He had to find a substitute because there was nobody to take our place. That is what a substitute does. A substitute takes the place of another. So there was nobody to take the place of sinful man. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. So no man could have gone to the cross as a substitute to appease, to propitiate the demand by God for justice for the sins of men. And so, having found a substitute, God created for us redemption. Redemption. Which means to buy back by the pain of a price. To buy back. And remember, I gave you the example of your expensive beer when you go to the pawn shop 
and you put it there, it's held captive until you could come back and pay the money that was given to you by the pawnbroker. broker. But interest, of course. And we said that, and people still say it today, I'm going to redeem my expensive bira. They use the word redeem. And so a useful picture of what Christ did for us. He redeemed us when he died on Calvary. When he paid the price. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 to 14 for me. Redemption to buy back by the pain of a price. And the price was his blood. He couldn't buy our salvation with money. But with his own blood. So Colossians chapter 1 13 to 14 says I'm just recuperating on the atonement. The four aspects of the atonement. Propitiation, substitution, redemption. God calls Colossians 1, 13 to 14. I can get it if you can't. Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says, you get it yet? All right. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's how all sins were forgiven, by blood. Somebody had to pay the price to us who were locked down in the pawn shop of sin. Or in Satan's prison house. Somebody had to go and buy us back. Somebody had to have the price. And Jesus had the price. His sinless blood. And we, we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. So we, he secured our redemption for us. And then the last thing he did... As part of the atonement, he completed the atonement when he reconciled sinful man to himself. And the gulf between sinful man and a holy God was bridged through reconciliation. And reconciliation means the changing of a relationship from enmity to friendship. The changing of a relationship from enmity to friendship. We were enemies of God. Once we were living in sin, we were enemies. All right? Look at um, Romans 5, 10 and 11. And see how God changed our relationship and completed his work of atonement from his anger at sin to reconciliation with us. For if when we were enemies, Listen to that. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Blood paid the price to reconcile us. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Those are powerful words of assurance. So God accomplished the work of reconciliation. And he accomplished the work of atonement when our salvation was achieved and when we, and we today, stand in a reconciled relationship with God. Let me repeat that. We today stand in a reconciled relationship with God. We are no longer enemies, but we are now friends of God. But God didn't stop at atonement. He didn't stop at our reconciliation. He didn't stop when we became no longer enemies but his friends. God has blessed us far more. He went further than that. He did other things for us. He gave us other blessings, spiritual blessings 
that gave us a tremendous assurance of our salvation. He gave us tremendous, tremendous blessings added to the atonement. And that's why this morning my text is Colossians 2 and verse 10. Colossians 2 and verse 10. So having recapped where I left you off on the 21st of April, we're going to go forward now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to offer up your word to your people. I pray, O oh God, that you would increase in the spirits of your people, that they would magnify you and exalt you with the amazing God that you truly are. Bless your word today. May your people's hearts rejoice when they leave here with the full assurance of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Colossians, my text, 2 and 10. Let's start from verse 9. For in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, the fullness of the divine nature was in the body of Christ when he walked on this earth. The fullness of the divine nature. He was both God and man. And maybe one of these days I will talk to you about what God has revealed to us about the Trinity. Because a lot of people have problems with the Trinity. Don't talk about other religions. But the scriptures have given us enough for us to know as in this verse here, that in Jesus was the fullness of the divine nature. He was fully God, even when he was in a human body. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. He created every spiritual being that exists in the world today, including Satan and his hordes of demons and fallen angels. That is why one day every knee will bow including Satan and all his angels. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord because he created all of them. He's the head of all principality and power. Those are ranking angels. Bad and good. But I'm talking to you today now on Complete in Christ. That's my topic. Complete in Christ. So the foundation is laid. The foundation of the atonement is laid. But God went further than that. And God deposited in us some tremendous blessings which we want to look at today. And we will see how we are complete in Christ. Not only did we experience the blessings of the atonement. Now last time I was here, I ended on, I just went beyond the atonement and I ended on 1 Corinthians 5 and 21. Which says, 1 Corinthians 5, 21. Which says, and he has made him sin for us. Who knew? He has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And deal with the first part first. When Jesus went to Calvary, I explained this to you. God treated him as a guilty sinner. God treated him as a guilty sinner. As if he was guilty of all the sins that we ever committed before we came to him. And that, in fact, the sins of the entire world. God regarded him as a guilty sinner. He who knew no sin 
God deposited all the sins of mankind, past, present, and future, in him. He made him to be sin for us. He took all of our sins. Just now we saw in the book of Peter, he bore all our sins in his own body on the cross, on the tree. All the sins of mankind in order to achieve the atonement was deposited in the body of Christ. He made him sin for us who knew no sin. But he did that in order that, second part of the verse, we might become the righteousness of God in him. So what he did when we come to him as children of God and we accept Christ in our lives is God treats us as if we committed all the righteous acts that Jesus ever did. Can you imagine that? He made him the right that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I told you it was a kind of an exchange. He took our sins in his own body and we took all his righteousness. And when God looks at us today, we are his righteous children. That's a powerful, powerful verse. And that's why he went to the cross. And that's why he had to pay the full penalty for sin. Because God imputed to us his righteousness. God imputed to us his righteousness. That we may become the righteousness of God in him. I ended on that the last time. So this morning I want to go on to talk about other wonderful things God has done. To show us how complete we are in Christ. We do not need to do any works. To earn salvation. To, to achieve salvation. The work of grace. Was complete. And we are complete today. There is nothing to be added. Nothing more to be added to God's salvation. It's perfect and complete. And we are complete in him. So this morning we want to talk about other things that God has done for us. No other religion talks about this. God has done a work of regeneration in our lives. A work of regeneration in our lives. Regeneration, to regenerate is to Give a new nature to something. We were sinners. We had an old nature. Given to sin. Born in sin. Shaped in iniquity. That's the nature we had. But at Calvary, God gave us a new nature. He regenerates us when we come to him. Tell me, Mr. John, Gospel of John now. Chapter 3. Regeneration. Receiving a new nature through the second birth. That's the meaning of regeneration. Receiving a new nature through the second birth. John chapter 3. The Gospel of John tells us when Nicodemus came to him. Let's take it from verse 4. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. All of us were born of the flesh through our mother. And that which is born of the spirit, that's the second birth, spiritual birth, that which is born of the, the, the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Born again. We're dealing with regeneration. We have to receive a new nature. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the song of it. Verse 8. But cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The point Jesus was making there is that you can't see the wind. You can't see the wind. 
You can't control it. But you could see evidence of the wind. You can see the trees wafting when the breeze blows. You can feel if you're feeling hot and the breeze blows on you. So you know that the breeze exists. You don't know where it comes from. But you know it exists. And he says, so it is with the Holy Spirit. We cannot control the Holy Spirit. But we know that he lives in us. Just as we know the breeze exists, even though we don't see it. We don't see the Holy Spirit, but we know he lives in us. He bears witness to us that we are the children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We know that we know that we know that we are God's children because the Spirit bears witness. We can't see him, but we know he exists. He does a number of things for us. He helps us in our prayer. He heals our sickness. And that's the point Jesus was making. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. We are born of the Spirit. We have a new nature. So, first Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter, I think on 17, 5 and 17. Second Corinthians 5 and 17. Put that up on the screen for me. Talks about the fact that we are a new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old King James has creature, but creature sounds ugly, right? He's a new creation. A better translation. All things are passed away. Our old nature is gone when we accept Christ into our lives. It doesn't mean that we don't sin because we are still in the flesh. But as far as God is concerned, that old nature is gone because he has regenerated us. All things are all things have passed away and behold all things have become new we are now new creatures we are born again with a new nature that allows us to communicate with God because the people in the world cannot communicate with God the Holy Spirit doesn't live in them and we communicate with God through the Holy Spirit who lives in us our spirit and the Holy Spirit communicates that is what makes us God conscious our spirit the world doesn't know him and therefore it cannot really communicate with him. But we can because we have the new nature. We were born of the spirit. So that's another wonderful blessing that God has added to the atonement. He has given us a new nature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. He has regenerated us. Then he goes on to give us even further gifts. He didn't stop there. He justifies us. God justifies us. We have to go into the courtroom to understand what justification means. Because it's a legal term. Justification means to be deemed righteous. To be deemed righteous. And in our legal system, if somebody has been incarcerated for years, 25, 40 years, he can be pardoned from his sin. The president on Independence Day does normally bring out a list of pardons, right? And pardon this one, pardon that one. And they all walk out of prison free men. But a pardon does not mean legally if a prisoner is pardoned, he is still guilty before the law. He is still a guilty person. He has not paid his debt to society. Because when you commit a sin, you really owe society. You are indebted to society because you have violated society's moral codes and laws. And that's why you end up in prison. So legally, the president may pardon you. 
but you are still guilty. On the other hand, if you go to the courts, you have a matter, whatever it might be, and a jury sits and says you are not guilty, you walk out of that court a righteous man. It's as if you did not offend society. You owe society nothing. It's different from being pardoned. And this is what God has done for us when he made us righteous, when he justified us. We have become righteous. We owe nothing more to him. We owe nothing more to him. We were deemed not guilty. We were deemed not guilty. So God justifies us. And when he looks upon us, he sees us as justified, as if we have never committed a sin. Romans 5 and 8. Therefore being justified. Romans 5 8. Therefore being justified by faith. We. Who is justified? We. Therefore being justified by faith. Romans 5 8. 5 8. Did I get our scripture verse wrong? Romans 5 1. Sorry, 5 1 and then 9. 5 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The man who a jury found not guilty is at peace with society because he owes society nothing. He was found not guilty. And so it is with God. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are justified when we put our faith in Him. When we accepted Christ into our lives, He justifies us at the point of salvation. We are now righteous before Him. When God looks upon us, He sees righteous children. No longer sinners. Like I said, we may commit sin, but then he's provided a means for us. If a man sins, we have an advocate with the Father. All right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So if we sin, it doesn't mean our righteousness has gone. As far as God is concerned, we are permanently righteous once we gave our lives to Christ. We are justified in his sight. Then he went further. The blessings continue. That's why we are complete in Christ. All of this is our inheritance. He adopts us into his family. Pause and think about that. Look at 1 John 3. 1. 1 John, the epistle. So God's work of salvation was complete from the atonement right down and all these blessings, these additional spiritual blessings he added to us. 1 John chapter 3. To justify is to acquit. You ever heard the expression? He was acquitted. He was acquitted. Kamala, you know what that means? To acquit. We are set free. When we are justified, Sister Jean, we were set free. That's why we have peace with God. We were set free. We were acquitted when we were justified. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. You see the exclamation mark there? That's a powerful statement in other words. That we should be called, Juliana, the children of God. All of us. I can end my message right here until you walk out of here and go home. My message is finished. You are children of God. We should be called the children of God. What manner of love. The amazing love of God. But it's better than that. Not only are we children, 
of God. But let's look at the book of Romans 8. Romans 8, 16 to 17. Romans chapter 8, 16 to 17. Romans 8 the spirit of himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God all of us know, all of us have had that knowledge once we are saved, all of us know we just know the spirit bears witness to us we have no doubt about it go ahead we are children of God and if children if children, you know, remember just now we saw John saying that what manner of love that God, we should be called the children of God. It goes on to say, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Who's an heir? Sister Yaz, an heir is somebody who inherits something. So we children, because we've been adopted by God, we have become heirs. We have inherited something. Heirs of God. And not only that, pay attention, joint heirs with Christ. Cry with Christ. What have we done to deserve that? What has any of us done to become a joint heir of God's kingdom with Christ? That's a lot of love. Go with me to Ephesians 1. I'm dealing with adoption now. We have become children, his children. He only had one son. Now he has many children. Millions of us. Romans. Ephesians, sorry, chapter 1. Verse 4 to 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now that another message I'll bring one day to you. That before you were even born, at the foundations of this earth, God chose you for salvation. God looked down through time and God picked each one of you. It's called election in the Bible. He elected you. He elected us to choose. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Go on. Verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. God predestined you to be a son, Chris. Brother Mike. This predestination, he preordained it. He determined it before this world was even begun, God found Brother Mike and Brother Sean and everyone sitting down here who is saved. God identified you and he put you in a place to hear his salvation, his gospel. He fixed it. He fixed your destiny. And he predestined us to adoption as sons. As sons. We are adopted into his family. Adoption is the giving of sonship to someone who's not a member of a family. None of us were members of his family before the atonement. None of us. Before we met Christ. But when he saved us by his grace, 
he gave us sonship the giving of sonship to one who is not a member of a family that's what God has done for us and lastly oh, Ephesians 1 4 to 5 uh, Galatians 4 I mean, this is my last verse on adoption Galatians 4 6 to 7 as you go through the terrain of the pages of the Bible we see all these truths Galatians chapter 4, 6 to 7. And because you are sons, because you are sons, listen to your position in Christ, you know. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Daddy, Father, the spirit into your hearts. The spirit lives in us. Yes. Saying, Daddy, Father. Go ahead. Verse 5. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. Walk, walk out of here this morning, certain sure. You are a son. Yes. Sister Mull, tell Kamala she's a son. Tell the person next to you, you are a son. Yeah, everybody. Tell some dead person next to you, you are a son. You are a son. Thank you, darling. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. An heir of God through Christ. What are we going to inherit? You want to know what we're going to inherit as heirs? Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. You will see what we are going to inherit. And as you read this, ask yourself, what have I done to deserve this? But for the love, of, the amazing love of God. Revelation 5 and 10. I don't want to read the whole passage, but it deals with the elders in heaven during the, the tribulation period. And they are singing a song unto God during the great tribulation. But at the end of the song, it says, And you have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Laura, tell me that I'm going to reign on this earth. Tell me I'm going to reign on this earth. I'm going to reign on this earth. Jen, you're going to reign on this earth. You know, sir, reign to rule. That is what we are going to inherit. This kingdom to come. And there's no doubt about this kingdom to come. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare it, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We have a kingdom to inherit. We are joint heirs with Christ because he is going to govern this earth with us. We are going to be the government of this earth to come. And all of us will have a place in that government. Because it is our kingdom. We are joint heirs with Christ of this kingdom to come. And we shall reign on the earth. We're going to live in no clouds. We're going to have an earth to govern. And all of us will have a place in God's economy. All of us. That's why we are heir, a joint heir with Christ. He is the head, and we will be working with him to establish his righteousness, his holiness in the kingdom to come. The last thing, he wrongs off his blessings with our glorification. So having adopted us into his family, glorification. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. This is the last. This is the only blessing we have not yet received. But you know who have received it? Flynn's mother. Sister Muni Day. Pastor's mother. 
This is the only one we who are alive have not yet. In fact, they too have not yet received this last blessing. But all of us will. Up first, first, first Corinthians 15, verse 42. 42 to 44. Our glorification. This is the totality of our salvation. Salvation with all its various dimensions. So also is the resurrection of the dead. And if ever you want to understand the resurrection of the dead and the rapture and so on, an important chapter to read is 1 Corinthians 15. It's the resurrection chapter of the Bible. And Paul is talking here about the resurrection. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. We went down in the grave, dead, and our flesh will rotten, or we are burnt. It is raised in incorruption at the rapture. Our bodies will be raised in incorruption. Go ahead. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. See our glorification there? And we will see how our bodies will be raised in glory just now. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. The body we're going to have is not this body. This is a powerless body that is prone to sick, prone to disease, prone to death. Samantha, this body is a weak body, a perishing body. So, it is sown in weakness, but it is going to be raised in power. Go ahead. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. That's the kind of body we will have. A spiritual body. Not this flesh and blood. And there is a, there's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Go on to verse from 44. Go on to meet verse 50 to 53. 50. Now I say this, brethren. That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This is the body we live in. We cannot enter heaven with this body. Because this is a sinful body. This is a corruptible body. This body cannot enter the kingdom of God. We have to have a new body. A glorified body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Go ahead. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery meaning that these things were not revealed in the past, but they've been revealed in the New Testament. Amen. I tell you a mystery. So we are now understanding this mystery. It's not being rolled out to us. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. That's our glorification. We shall all be changed. In other words, all of us will not die at the coming of Christ. That's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, alive and remain. So all of us will not sleep. That word sleep there means die. But we shall all be changed. Go ahead. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, we shall all be changed. That's our glorification. That's the only blessing we have not yet received. Even those who have died in Christ. That's the last blessing we have not yet received in salvation. The blessing of glorification. But a glorified body awaits us. And we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That means in nanoseconds at the last trump. So when the trumpet is sung, the Bible says that Jesus is going to descend from heaven with a shout and with, a, and with a, the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. That's the trumpet when we will be changed. As soon as we hear that, only the righteous who are alive and, the, and those who are dead will hear that trumpet. And when that trumpet songs, because he will descend from heaven with a shout, we will hear that shout. If we are living among 
or working among unsafe people, they're not going to hear it. We will hear it. If you're playing football on the field, and we are saved, we will hear it. They will hear it. But a shout. And with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, we will hear it. And at that moment, we are going to be immediately changed in the twinkling of an eye. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Everybody say that. We shall be changed. That is our glorification. So that wrongs off God's love for us. It wrongs it off. And we are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ. There is nothing to be added to our salvation. Jesus accomplished it all when he went to Calvary. We have to do nothing. We have to commit no work. We don't have to do any good deeds to get to heaven. Because salvation is not earned. It is received. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to do anything to get into heaven. It is complete God's work of grace. And all these elements pulled together speaks to our salvation. Bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want the worship team to come afterwards and sing a song for me. I want you all song this morning. When eternity ends and starts over again, we will praise you, Lord. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to give thanks and praise unto you. For your glorious and complete salvation in our lives. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We can never, oh God, completely say thanks. Never. For the great things you have done for us. So we bless you, almighty God, as your children. And all we can do is lift our hearts and lift our hands and lift our voices unto you. And say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your perfect and finished work of salvation. For when your son died on the cross, he said, it is finished. You cannot add anything to something that is finished. You cannot add any works. We cannot add good deeds. We can add nothing. Jesus said his work of salvation was finished. So we thank you again. We bless you. Please bless the hearts of your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. I will praise Sing along, you, sing along, everybody. Lord, with every breath that I take, I will praise you, Lord. This promise I made, and should it
I just want to pray for two people here this morning. I want to pray for Brother Felix, three people actually, Brother Felix and Sister Edna. Brother Felix, Sister Edna. Could you all come? When eternity ends and starts over again, even then I will praise you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord, with every breath that I take. I will praise. before the altar today before your altar oh God I lift up this man and I pray oh God you're going to pour out a blessing upon his body from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet oh mighty God you know his fears you know his concerns and I pray you're going to take them all away from him his father the spirit of the living God visits this man and tends to the affliction in his body and heals him, oh God, from his very root and turn back, turn back and turn around and root out, oh God, root out the affliction. I pray in Jesus' mighty name, I commit him into the hands of the Holy Spirit right now and his healing and his full recovery. In Jesus' powerful name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Oh God, I bring my sister before you. My sister, but she's your child. And she has her own afflictions, Lord. But your word says with God, nothing shall it be impossible. I pray, oh God, you're going to strengthen her faith. I pray, oh God, that you're going to cause the spirit of the living God to touch this woman at the point of her affliction and deliver her in a mighty way, oh God, that she will have a testimony before men and women. Bless this woman, oh God, with your healing power, I pray. Turn back and create a breakthrough, oh God. Deliver her that she will rejoice in you. Rejoice in her deliverance. I ask in Jesus' precious name that the Spirit of God will touch her. Touch her at the point of her affliction and restore. Restore that which threatens her. I know it. I cancel it. By the power of the blood of Calvary, I cancel it, Lord. I cancel it in the name of Jesus. And I declare, I declare by the blood of Calvary that she is healed. That she is healed, oh God. And I 
thank you for doing it, Lord. Let this woman rejoice. Cause this woman to burst out and rejoice in over what you have done for her. In Jesus' name I pray. husband, but as minister, I want to ask my wife to come. I want to pray for her as the minister of God, as a servant, not as husband. I pray for her as a husband who, but before the altar of God, I would like the people who I see standing with her so much to come forward. People who are traipsing in and out of our house regularly or in and out of a vehicle regularly. I want to ask Sister Molly, I want to ask Sister Natalie, I want to ask Sister Catherine to come forward. And I want to ask one board member, as you are right there, to come and stand behind. that you have put her into this church Lord. and for the work that you have given to her I thank you O oh God for her talent in administration her talent in leadership I thank you O oh God that she is a blessing to this church for you have said that you would gift your church with all of the gifts and talents it needs to be effective and you have given her to us and I praise you for her Will be upon her. I ask the spirit of leadership, the spirit of discernment, would be upon her. And Father, you would bless her with great health and strength, that she would go on to do great things for you. Oh, mighty God, I commit her into your hands and I cover her with the blood of Jesus right now. Right now. Thank you for what she is doing, what you have given her to do. And for that, Father, the interest and the energy that she has brought to this job. And I pray, O oh God, that you will take her to higher heights and further places. In the name of Jesus, may your blessings be showered upon her right now. In Jesus' name, amen. God, I thank you. Could you stretch your hands out to this? Because Brother Flynn's mother has died, died yesterday. Father and God, I bring before you this wonderful couple in this church. Almighty God, at this time of bereavement, I ask you that the Spirit of God would strengthen them with divine power and strength. Mighty God, I pray that the arms of the Holy Spirit, His everlasting arms, would surround them and they would sense your love. They would sense your presence at this time. Oh God, I ask you to stand with them in this time of loss. I am glad, oh God, that my brother was able to say to me this morning, I am not staying home. I know where my mother has gone. And he said to me, what is the point of staying home? So I thank you for that faith. Thank you for his faith. I thank you for his wife who stands by him, Lord. And I pray, oh God, that you would see them through this period of bereavement. Comfort them with the comfort of heaven. Oh, mighty God, and I'm happy that their hearts are made glad even in the time of loss because their mother has gone to be with you. So bless them, Lord, with your presence. 
with all that is good, comfort them in the days and the weeks and in the months ahead. I give them now into your hands. In Jesus' name. I know how to work this Thank you, Pastor Keith. Hallelujah.